It's nice to have visitors, nice to have people who not only visit but share in the gospel with us while they are here and take the memory of the work and go back to Northern Ireland and pray for us more intelligently. And we're grateful for that as this work seeks to strengthen and go forward. But we're turning to Isaiah 44, Isaiah chapter 44. We've been doing a topical series, our first topical series really, uh, over the recent weeks. And it's on the topic of revival. And there's much said about revival, talked about revival, and a lot of it is misunderstood. We've been trying to clear up some of the misunderstandings about what a spiritual awakening or revival is, and taking the scripture as we find it, and dealing with various aspects. As we said before, there's a bit of overlap uh, with regard to prayer and so on. Prayer is always at the heart of it. The Word of God is always at the heart of it. But there are various aspects we consider. So today we'll be thinking of the picture of revival because we're given a picture of it here and it has instruction for us. Isaiah 44, we'll take time to read the opening six verses. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Amen. Ending there at verse 6. Let's still our hearts momentarily for prayer. You need to hear from the Lord. I do as well. May God come and minister to us through his word. Our God and Father, once again we come to this time of opening up the scriptures. And once again we find ourselves in this prophecy, so full of instruction even on this topic. We pray that thou wilt come and help us to understand thy mind and thy will. Help us, O God, to grasp what is revealed here and understand it not only in its own context, but what it's saying to us here and now. We pray thy Spirit will apply the Word. That's it. Just that the Holy Ghost will come and take what is the Word of God and apply it to hearts. Remember those who are afar off. Remember those who are cold in heart. We pray that thou wilt come upon them and let them not continue on in spiritual apathy and indifference. Use thy word to stir them, to awaken them, and that all of us here might be drawn out in deeper affection toward Jesus Christ. It's all for him. It's all that he may be glorified. So come, Lord, and do thy work. And build thy church and fill me with the Holy Ghost, with wisdom, power, and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we remind you that the prophecy of Isaiah is set in the context of a man called to preach to a people under the judgment of God. The day is a day of spiritual decay, not unlike the day we're living in with regard to the negligence toward the things of God. The people of God are likened unto Sodom and Gomorrah. We find that in the opening chapter. Strong language that the Lord uses so that we get the idea of just how far gone they are. And the first 39 chapters, largely speaking, are chapters of judgment. There's not really much encouraging about the opening 39 chapters of Isaiah. Read through it for yourself. You'll find that to be the case. It's all condemnation, judgment, warning, calling to repentance, and so on and so forth. But from chapter 40 onwards, the language changes. 
The expressions change. The emphasis changes. And you'll see that from the opening language of chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her, and so on. And the context there, as you read it, we'll, you'll see that the message begins to be applied not to those who are under judgment, but to those who will come after, to the generation who will rise up and find themselves in a strange land, in a place that was not home to them, and feel that God had cut them off completely. And what God is endeavoring to do through Isaiah is to speak language that in the future would be taken to heart by some of the people and applied to their circumstances. Instead of feeling, well, here God has cut us off, he brought our fathers into Babylon, and he will never bring us back into Jerusalem ever again. Instead of feeling that way, the Lord is giving language to hem in that feeling of, of uncertainty or the feeling of, of total loss. And he's saying to them, no, don't feel that way at all. I'm giving words of comfort, words of encouragement, words that aim to the fact that I will bring you again into the land. So he's comforting them. And what we're finding here in these chapters from verse, or chapter 40 onwards is language of comfort. And if you know the, chapter, the, the book of Isaiah, and if there are any passages of encouragement to you, they're probably in this latter part. They're probably here, even in the, the 40s, because there's particular words of encouragement in these chapters. It is peppered, for example, with the language of fear not. You'll see that in chapter 41. And verse 10 is a a portion I turn to frequently when I am encouraging people and when I'm not sure what else to turn to, if my mind's at a loss to their circumstances, to what they're facing, this is often a verse that comes immediately to mind. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. What a tremendous text that is. And if you're here this morning and feeling yourself somewhat at a loss spiritually, you're feeling yourself dismayed, discouraged, you're feeling yourself downcast, get a hold of Isaiah 41 verse 10. Pray over it. Meditate upon it. Let it get into your soul and let it become real. God, the living God that you've put your soul, uh, entrusted your soul to, is saying to you, fear thou not. I am with thee. Be not dismayed. I am your God. <laughs> I am your God. And I'll strengthen thee, help thee, uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And if you go on down through those verses, you'll see the tremendous encouragement, but I'll not read them all. Um, if you read verse 13, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Verse 14, Fear not thy worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Yes, we're worms. <laughs> worms can't do much to defend themselves. They're, they're not really of much value. And that's the picture the Lord is saying. You're like a worm, and yet still, still you're mine. <laughs> you're my people. And while you may be a worm in a certain context with regard to your sin and your rebellion, Yet you're my worms, you're my people, you're my children. And so I will help you. I will come to your ear. Fear not, fear not, fear not. On and on it goes. Chapter 43, verse 1. Again. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art not mine. And again, you see the specificity here. I've called you by name. I know you individually. I know who you are. Fear not. I know you in your own personal circumstances. Verse 5 of the same chapter. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. Again, remembering the context. This is to a people who would find themselves in bondage, in captivity, in a foreign land. What's God saying? Don't fear. I'm with you. And being with you, inevitably, I will gather you again together, encouraging them. And we come then to chapter 44. And there are words here that are along the similar vein. We saw there in verse 2, halfway through, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshur on whom I have chosen. And verse 8 of the same chapter, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. 
So God is encouraging his people with language of fear not. And it's amazing, isn't it, that God has to repeat the same phrase over and over again. You would think one fear not in the Bible would suffice. And we would take that one fear not, and we would remember it, and we would meditate upon it, and whenever we're fe feeling fearful, that we would then remind ourselves that God has said fear not. But he hasn't given us one. He has given us hundreds. And you go through the Word of God, you'll find hundreds of fear not, fear ye not, fear thou not. Why is God doing that? Because he understands. He sympathizes with his people. In the midst of their particular distresses and the nuances of their own circumstances, God comes and says, dear believer, dear child of mine, don't fear, don't fear. Take that to heart, child of God, take it to heart. And if there's anything we need in a time that would lend itself to fear, it's a word from God, isn't it? That's what we want. And if you're here and you're in a position where there is that tendency toward fearfulness because of the uncertainty of the future or other matters surrounding your life, then I want you, I want you, dear child of God, to take this to heart. You need a word from God. And what you should be praying for is, Lord, give me a word. Give me a word. Let me hear from you. There's not enough believers doing that today, you know. Not enough believers coming before God and saying, give me a word. I need a word in season. I need a word for this difficulty. Lord, encourage me in your word. The Word of God is a rock, you see. It's what we depend upon, what we rest in. It's that which God has given to help us reveal Himself, or help us understand Himself as He has revealed Himself to us in that Word. But we're thinking then of the picture of revival that's seen here in the language of Isaiah 44. And I want you to note with me, first of all, is a picture that reminds us of a gracious past. Is a picture that reminds us of a gracious past. Look at verse 1 and 2, read them over again. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord, that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Look at the language that's used here regarding these people. Jacob, servant, Israel, chosen, made, and formed from the womb. And as we seek for the blessing of God, as we long for God's favor, either individually or corporately or even nationally, when we think about that need for God to come, we do so on the basis of a past that has been gracious, that we know God has been gracious to us in the past. Do you know it? Tell me you know it. Please, please tell me this morning you're sitting here and you're thinking, yes, preacher, the Lord has been gracious to me in the past. I trust that is the case and you can see it. You might feel terribly discouraged by your own spiritual life. You might find within yourself there's a lack of wanting even revival. And yet, yet you may honestly say there is some degree of desire. I honestly would love to see a change in this church, in this community, in this city. I would love it. I would love to see the day of the sound of abundance of rain. I would love to know that the sound isn't merely just the sound anymore, but the rains have come, and He shall send showers of blessing. This is the promise of God, that He has promised to send showers of blessing to His people, and we long to see it. There's a little desire within our hearts, is there not? I think there is. Uh, we want to see it. And because there is that little interest and desire for revival, it indicates that you've had a gracious past, because People outside of Christ don't desire that. People who don't know the Lord don't long for revival. It's those who have been saved, those who have a past that we can say, God has been gracious to me. Look at the previous chapter, verse 22 of chapter 44, or chapter 43, sorry. Just back a bit and you'll see the position these people truly were in by nature, by their own natural ways. This is how they're described. Verse 22, But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Is that you today? Are you weary? Are you weary in your walk with God? That's the case for so many. Verse 23, Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor weary thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins, and hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Yes, the true state of Israel, by nature, are a people wearying God with their sins. And that is the case for us all. 
You're right there. Every one of us is right there in that language. We don't worship God as much as we should. We don't bring to Him as much sacrifice as He deserves. Indeed, even in light of all that we know here this morning, we still don't do enough. But our life, as we look at the past, we see truly by nature, there I am. I've wearied the Lord with my iniquities. I have. And yet what makes a difference? Something we did. Came to the 1st of January one year and we turned over a new leaf and everything was different from that moment. No, no. Look at verse 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. No, it wasn't something you did. It's something the Lord did. It's something the Lord did. At one point, at one stage in your life, God came and made himself known to you. You had no desire for him. You weren't longing for him. And you may have some kind of interest that was kind of rising because of circumstance of life or some interest in spiritual things. But is it not true that he came and made himself known to you? He came. He came and he wanted to forgive you your sin. I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. I removed your sin. Why? For mine own sake. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we often think in terms of forgiveness of, our own, of my sake. It was for my sake. He forgave me for my sake. And it's just true, isn't it? I, I'm being forgiven is a tremendous blessing. Uh, I can say as, as great that he forgave me. And I feel that personally as a wonderful thing. But truly, it's for his own sake. It glorifies him to forgive the sinner. It glorifies him to remove the sins of his people. They're his people. He wants them to be with him. He wants them to be near to him. And so what's he done? Well, in order to bring them near, what do I need to do? I need to remove the hindrance. I need to remove the barrier. And what's the barrier? The barrier is sin. And so what does God do? He sets out in the course of blotting out your transgressions. That's what he did for this people. If you're here this morning and you, you can say, I've had my sins forgiven. I know that there upon that cross at Calvary, Jesus died for my sin. You have a gracious past, don't you? You have. At some point, God stepped in. And you should remember the pit from whence you've been digged. You should recall the fact that you're not like others. You're not. You're not the same as everyone else. And not by reason of your own effort either, but by the mercy of Almighty God who stepped in. That's the only difference. If you're here and you think that you've become better because you made certain decisions or you took a certain path or, you know, I'm not like my brother who lives this way or like my sister who lives the other way. I'm better than them because I chose a path of religiosity, the Christian path, and they didn't. You're looking at it all wrong. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. That is a sovereign decision in the mind of God. Something we can't fully comprehend in a certain degree. We must resign ourselves to the fact that he has chosen a people. He has set his love upon them from all eternity. And he forgives them. That's grace, you see. It's not a gracious past if it's earned, is it? It's not a gracious, it's an earned past. I earned it. I did this, that, and the other, and I deserved it. But that's not grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is God's goodness when you deserve the opposite. When you deserved hell, God stepped in and showed you mercy. When we think about revival, those of us longing for it, praying for it, desiring it to de various degrees, will always have a gracious past, always. There will always people regenerate, people with life, people with Christ, people with the Holy Ghost living in their hearts. Yeah, yeah. And yet, we are a people, and we're quite content to know our mediator regardless of what else he may do with our life. If my whole testimony was summed up in verse 25, if everything was known about me, if everything there was to know about me was summed up in verse 25, and my entire Christian existence was summed up in verse 25, I'd be very happy. I'd be, I'd be joyous that I've had my sins forgiven that I have a mediator who is saying this language, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. I went to the cross. I bore your sin upon my body. You're blessed, tremendously blessed. And yet, that doesn't mean to say we don't desire the Lord to work. 
for him to come in a greater measure of blessing. There are some who are Christian in name because of what they can get out of it. That's exclusively why they call themselves Christian. That's the error of deceived Christianity. I'm a Christian because of what I can get out. Now, they don't say that, but you'll see them focusing upon the thing the carnal man desires. Health, wealth, and prosperity. That's what... There isn't a person in the world that doesn't want that, you know. <laughs> Not a person in the world. Everyone wants health, wealth, and prosperity. Go out there and ask them, would you like more health? Would you like more wealth? Would you like greater general prosperity? Yes, of course. Of course. And if you preach to Christianity and that's your heart, you'll have no problem getting the attention of the multitudes. That's the very thing they're looking for. But, but when you have the attitude of Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's showing something different, isn't it? That's not the way the world thinks, is it? If they say they come to a God who has complete sovereign control over their life and I may choose to afflict them and like Job come to the point where you see that God himself is going to take me out of this scene of time you will say I will trust him anyway because he is all in all I have this past my sins forgiven I know Jesus Christ and even if he slays me I will trust him and those who are truly seeking revival will always have that they will seek God and go after God and be faithful to God, whether he sends revival or not, whether he sends them prosperity or not, wealth or not, or causes them to go through life with great health or little health. They will always just trust him and love him. The prophecy of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. What's he painting a picture of here? <laughs> of desertion, of destitution, of, of there being nothing. That's the picture that's painted. The prophet's saying here, there's nothing. Nothing in the natural realm to encourage. Absolutely nothing. But he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. What way is he thinking there? He's thinking about the past. His own salvation. God redeeming him. God saving him. God bringing him to himself. And if his future is one where the stalls and the herds and whatever are all destitute and there's no fruit in the vines and there's no olive, olives and the olive trees, if there's nothing, nothing in my future but curse and blight, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The true people of God who are desiring revival, they, this is their attitude. This is the way they think. They, they are careful to realize that the heart of the issue is that God has redeemed me. Uh, my past is a gracious past. But not only that, we see here in this picture, not only that it's a gracious past, but the picture reminds us of a gospel-needy posterity. A gospel-needy posterity. If you go on in the language from verses 1 and 2 to verse 3, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. Here you get to the picture that's being painted here more clearly. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. It's talking here about our children. When the Lord pours forth his spirit, something happens to us and to our children. So there's a picture here of gospel needy posterity. Now in verse 3, it talks about the coming of the Spirit. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. That's interpreted for us. I will pour my Spirit upon thy seed. There's a pouring forth of the Spirit of God. And when we think about that pouring forth of the Spirit, it brings us into the New Testament. We should think about there. We should think about the language of John the Baptist when he told us about the ministry of Jesus Christ. In Luke three sixteen. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus Christ will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, what did that mean? 
Now, when you come to Acts chapter 1, you see a reminder of the language of John in that regard. In Acts 1 verse 5, it's referred to there, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So here's John in the beginning, before Christ even begins his ministry, talking about the Messiah, he baptized you with the Holy Ghost. And then at the very end, when Christ has ascended, at the time of his ascension, the church are being reminded, this is what Jesus will do. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. He will give you power. And then what goes on? What happens then in Acts? How does it begin? With them waiting. We looked at it last week in chapter 1 in the upper room. Pray. And then in chapter 2, God comes and he pours forth the Holy Ghost upon them. And they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Now that's Jesus Christ. That was the Lord doing that. He sent forth his spirit as he promised. John knew that's what his ministry would be. And he sent it forth. And so when Peter goes up to preach, actually, in the day of Pentecost, what does he say? Acts 2, verse 33. Very interesting text here. You can turn to it. It might help you remember. Acts 2, 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, speaking of Christ, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost... He hath shed forth, that is poured, same language, he has poured this which he now see and hear. Interesting, interesting. What happens in the book of Acts is what was promised or prophesied by John the Baptist and then promised by Jesus Christ and then he ascends and it takes place. It takes place. The pouring forth of the Spirit. And we should think about that when we come to Isaiah 44, verse 3. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. I will pour my Spirit upon thy seed. Pouring forth water. Pouring forth the Spirit. We think then about that which took place in the book of Acts. Now in what context did it take place? Because some might say to themselves, well, Pentecost was one day, it was one act, never to be repeated. And that's true to a degree. There won't be Pentecost again. There won't be a gathering of Jews, 3,000 of which will be converted. And there won't be an apostle called Peter, and the rest of them too, I believe, took, took part. There won't be all of them preaching. We can't replicate all of that. That's the past. That's gone. But, but, there still is this pouring forth. That's what we need to get a hold of. We need to realize the pouring forth of the Spirit is still presently for us. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost. While the church is in the world and Christ is at the right hand of the Father pleading the merit of his atonement, that's what he's doing right now. Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father pleading the merit of his atoning blood, praying for his church. Remember we thought of it last week. There as he was ascended up to heaven, what was he doing? Was he looking up toward the throne? Was he thinking, great, now I'm leaving this, this cursed world and going to the right hand of my father? Looking no, he wasn't, actually. Well, he was looking down upon his people with hands stretched forth, blessing them. And what was the blessing? The blessing was that they might have the Holy Ghost, the outpouring of the Spirit upon them. And what Peter reveals there in Acts 2.33, that since Christ is at the right hand of God exalted, and has received the promise of the Holy Ghost from the Father, he has shed forth the Spirit. Now let's think about that. If Christ went to the right hand of the Father, and since he was there, he received the Spirit to send it forth upon the church, if he is still there, is he not still doing the same thing? While he is still at the right hand of the Father, is it not part of his responsibility, part of his ministry, part of his mediatorial role to pour out, to send forth the Spirit upon the church? I tell you, it is, beloved. And again, I remind you upon the foundation with which it is sent forth. It's not sent forth upon the merit of your praying. And it's not sent forth upon the merit of your orthodoxy to truth. It's not. It's sent forth upon the merit of the blood of Christ. Now, the others come into play. Your fidelity, your desire, your longing, your orthodox theology, all of that will come into play. We've thought about certain elements of that in the past already. But largely speaking, foundationally speaking, Jesus Christ is shedding forth the Holy Ghost upon the church because he died on the cross. He has got that victory and that authority and that right. All power is given unto him, both in heaven and on earth. So we go forth. What, what doing? Preaching. 
And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I will go forth with you. I will send forth my Spirit upon you. And so, beloved, are we the church here? Are we? Are you the church? Then you must, you must be coveting, desiring, praying for the Holy Ghost. Tell me. In all these weeks that we've been going through these messages, and I've been presenting before you the need for the Spirit, have you been praying for it? Have you? What have you been praying for? What, has it changed the way you pray at all? And this is a sad reality that the preacher must face, that at times he preaches and the people hear, but they don't do. They don't do what they hear. So they hear of the words, but they're not doers of the word. And that is a sin. It's a sin. I instruct you. I am calling upon you. Not me, but God himself and his word. Pray for the Holy Ghost. Pray for this. Look, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Now look at the context of this for your encouragement. Because some of you are here with children outside of Christ. And what is the need? It's this here very thing. The outpouring of the Spirit of God. I will pour my Spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Why is that needy? Because they don't know God. The children don't know God. You say, well, they're Israel. Of course they know God. Well, yes, they know the letter, but they're not saved. They're not in Christ. And this is where we repudiate any kind of religiosity that doesn't call individuals to personal repentance of faith. We don't believe there's some salvific value in baptism or going through some other religious ceremony. We call people to individual repentance that you can get up and personally testify to God's saving grace in your life. That you realize that you personally have realized what mom and dad have realized, that I need Christ. And for those of us who are parents, we need to get that into our hearts and not make any presumptions about our children. Yes, yes, we may bring them to a point, little Susie, whatever, at whatever age she might be, seven, eight, nine, she prays a prayer. And we go through the rest of our lives remembering Susie prayed a prayer at that age. But Susie has never shown any fruit of the Spirit. None. And parents still go on holding on to this. I'm telling you, beloved, what you're holding on to is a prayer. It's not a genuine work of the Spirit. At least in some cases it's not. God alone knows fully. But I'm telling you, don't be presumptuous. Instead, pray for the outpouring of the Spirit. Pray that God would send forth the water spoken of here in this text. Look at it. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. They need this. Our children need this. They need the spirit. They don't need just the church, though they do need the church. As far as the church brings the word to them and faithfully ministers to them. And they need to see the body, and all that's right. But as far as getting before heaven, it's not what church did you attend, or how faithfully did you attend. And again, all of that comes into play. But critically, again, foundationally, it's this. Am I in Christ? Have I been regenerated by the Spirit? This is what your children need. Mom, Dad, you need to get a hold of this. The barrenness of your children's lives, spiritually, is because of a lack of the Spirit. Their ungodliness is because of a lack of the Spirit. You may look at your life and see the errors in your own leadership as a parent. You may. There isn't a parent who's ever existed that can't say otherwise. Or that can say otherwise. You can't. You can never say, like get to a point and say, I was the perfect parent. It doesn't exist. <laughs> there has never been a perfect parent, ever. Never a perfect parent, ever. Not even Mary, not perfect. Adam and Eve, not perfect. They had to witness the murder of one of their own sons by one of their own sons. They weren't perfect. And even if they had been, it didn't account for them, their children. So we can all look back and see, I feel here, I feel there. But what is the great need? What can we rectify today that we can't change about yesterday? What can we rectify? 
I can begin to pray for the Spirit for my children. Can I do that? Yes, I can. I can take that to heart. In the midst of revival, and yes, there's a need for spiritual awakening, but here it comes home to roost, doesn't it? My children need this. My children need the Holy Ghost. They need to be saved. All the parents would take this to heart. And look at the language of verse 4 as the picture is elaborated upon. They shall spring up as among the grass and as willows by the water courses. Willows in such places as by water grow rapidly. Indeed, very rapidly. So much so, there's a proverb that used to be spoken, read it in one of the commentaries. It said this, The prophet by willows will buy the owner a horse before that of other trees will pay for the saddle. And so this is how fast they grow. Willows grow so fast, especially when they're by a source of water, they grow so fast that the profit by willows exceeds any other tree. And there are certain parts of the world, even England and so on, where willows grow uh, very voraciously. And they grow rapidly. And there's great profit to be had in them. And here's the picture that the writer is giving to us, the Holy Spirit is giving to us. That, that our children, when the Spirit comes upon them, they will, be, they will spring up as among the grass, as willows by the watercourses. They will grow up and nothing can stop them. You hack them down, they'll grow up again. They just keep growing and multiplying and they, they bring profit to all around. This is what children can be. Instead of being a blight to us, instead of being a rod to our backs, instead of being the whole focus of our prayers, longing constantly that they might just get saved, instead of that, they'd be a blessing to us. They'd be a means of adding to our life, encouraging us. Instead of children always having to run and help them and pull them out of this hole and that hole and the other hole, instead they're pulling us out of holes. They're giving us words of encouragement. They're growing up to bless our souls. That's what children can be like if the Holy Ghost is poured forth upon them. And some of you need this. Indeed, there's many of us need it. God to come. And verse 5 shows their conversion. Shows the extent of their conversion. Look at this is tremendous text, really tremendous. I don't know if you got it when we were reading it, but get a hold of verse 5. This is what happens when the Holy Ghost comes upon our children. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Now there's nothing private about that, is there? <laughs> or we look at our children, we don't see them express the faith, and we wonder, well, maybe they're just quiet. Little Johnny's quiet, doesn't talk much about the Lord. Well, look what happens when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of his heart. I am the Lord's. That's what he'll say. <laughs> no, no shame whatsoever. I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, identifying with the people of God, with the Lord himself. And it goes on. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Say, I belong to the Lord. I am surnaming. <laughs> that is to say, I don't plan on changing this ever again. It's my surname. It's how I'm identified. I am the Lord's. That's who I belong to. This is what happens when the Holy Ghost comes upon our children, when the Lord gets a hold of them. And if you have ever met anyone who has been in a time of spiritual awakening, especially in their childhood, or teen, late, late teens and twenties, and they've known something of the Lord coming in mighty power, it never leaves them, you know. It never leaves them. They learn in that spiritual awakening, they learn what it is to be bold for Christ. And it's it taints them the rest of their days, you know. It does. I've met a few individuals like that. They've gone through mighty things in their early days. And God got a hold of them suddenly, and they began in the midst of God's blessing to speak forth boldly Christ and tell everybody about him. And the rest of their lives are marked by that same characteristic. They go on boldly confessing Jesus Christ. It's tremendous to see. What a way to start. And that is why, that is why we want the Holy Spirit poured forth. We want our children to be birthed in the power of God and to speak boldly for Him. We don't want shy children. We don't want children going along, and I don't mean we, don't, we want them brash and all that way. I mean for Christ. Quiet in spirit, bold in faith. That's the way we want. We want them to be soundly saved. I am the Lord's. And young people, that's what you're called to be like. That's what your parents want, you know. If your parents are worth anything. They want to hear you say, I am the Lord's. Confidently, boldly. Not just to them. Not just to them. To make them feel better about the fact that, you know, where you stand spiritually. They want to hear you say it to the ungodly. That you say it to your friends and those you work with. I am the Lord's. And parents, you're called to the same. <laughs> 
Let me not miss you out either. You're meant to say, I am the Lord's. I am the Lord's. We must move on to the final point then. It's a picture that reminds us of our godly proviso. There's a godly proviso here that is at the heart of this picture, and it's that of being thirsty. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Not them. Not them. It could say them, you know, but it doesn't. It says him. So in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, it begins with the individual. The individual has to be thirsty, has to have a thirst for the Lord, a thirst for him and for the outpouring of his Spirit. And then it moves on to groups like our children. I pour thy Spirit, my Spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring, and they shall spring up as among the grass, so on and so forth. But it begins with an individual, with a thirst. And the problem with spiritual thirst, you know, is that we don't always feel it as intensely as we do in the physical realm. When we are in the desert or we are working hard through the day and we begin to feel thirst and a parched palate, you can't ignore it. There's just something wrong with you if you, even people in their sickest of days lying in a sickbed will, will feel that dryness, that parchedness, and they'll be always constantly needing water and wanting it. But such a spiritual, such is the spiritual realm that you can be thirsty and not know it. You don't even know you have a thirst. You don't even realize how thirsty you really are. And that you're just going on, parched, thinking, trying to satisfy it with other things, and it never brings any satisfaction. You need to feel your thirst, you see. The, Christ, the church needs more Christians who are thirsty and feel their thirst. Homes that have thirsty people in them. Thirsty moms, thirsty dads, thirsty children. Speaking of his experience prior to the awakening in 1859, the revival that took place in Northern Ireland, and not just Northern Ireland, it took place in Wales, Scotland, and England as well, to a degree, although more scattered. But God came in 1859, and might have way, I've made reference to it on a number of occasions. But one minister recorded what he was faced with prior to the revival, what he was dealing with in his day. He says, hitherto our condition was deplorable. The congregation seemed dead to God, formal, cold, prayerless, worldly, and stingy in religious things. He's not talking about money merely, talking about with their time and their effort generally. They're just stingy with God. Twice I tried a prayer meeting of my elders, but failed. For after the fifth or sixth night, I was left alone. All along, I believed that the faithful use of the means of grace would be followed by their effects, as certainly as the tillage of a field is followed by a good crop, or as diligence in any profession is attended with success. And great was my disappointment, as year after year passed, yet still no fruit, no outpouring of the Spirit. I wondered and was grieved at what seemed so mysterious. What alarmed me most was the indisposition, almost hostility, of the people to meetings for prayer. They seemed mostly to think that they were well enough and that I was unnecessarily disturbing them. I had never been so desponding or distressed as during the weeks immediately preceding the awakening. I had almost ceased to hope. I felt as if I was almost alone, no one morning or praying with me. Dark days, immediately preceding the outpouring of the Spirit. But there was one minister, and he wasn't alone. There were others in the land who were feeling the same. Others meeting for prayer. There's little numbers. It begins with the individual, you see. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Here was a thirsty minister. And he couldn't understand why no one else had any thirst. Even his elders, come and pray. And five or six weeks in, they're not there. He's on his own. And that, that could happen. <laughs> it could happen here very easily, very easily. If we are not people of devotion, and if we don't understand our need, this man knew his need. For years he knew his need. For years he went on thirsty, craving, longing, thirsting, knowing this isn't right. We shouldn't be content with the fact that people come to church and go home again and express nothing of vivacious love for God. Shouldn't be content with that. 
We should be on in joy and love with Christ, boldly expressing Him, not making excuses for our dumbness with regard to testimony. We should be expressing our love for Jesus Christ to one and all and to our children, desiring that the Holy Ghost would grip their hearts and they'd live for God. And there he was alone. At least that's how he felt. Certainly in his own church he felt that way. Alone. Almost a hostility to prayer. I hope there's not that next week. Next Lord's Day. We come here for prayer. Mind the excuses, child of God. Mind the excuses. Mind the things that will come into your heart on Saturday or even Sunday and tell you, I can't do it. Too tired. Didn't get to bed in time. So on and so forth. Last time it was hard or find it difficult. Mind the excuses, child of God. Mind them. They're not of God. See, the dry ground is reflective of today. Floods upon the dry ground. That's what we need. We are in a period of dry ground and we need the Lord to come. And there's no substitute, as we close this, there's no substitute for feeling the need, for having a thirst. No substitute for that. Thirst is necessary. We need it before we're ever saved, you know. We need thirst. Later on, the same word is used uh, in chapter 55 and verse 1. It's a tremendous gospel uh, in invitation. Chapter 55, verse 1. You'll, you'll know it, no doubt. Ho, everyone that thirsteth. Same language. Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's an encouraging word uh, to anyone, especially even to the unsaved. If you're here this morning, realize that you need to feel your need of Christ. And if you feel your need of Christ, you may come. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Tremendous. Are you thirsting? Are you thirsting? Come to Christ. That's it. But also, it's used in terms of the believer as well. Someone thirsty, someone longing for water upon their soul, someone crying out for the Spirit upon their life. We need to feel the thirst. And we need to feel it here. We're not going to feel it in heaven, you know. You're not going to have the experience. It's one of the experiences that goes away. Thirst and hunger. Go on. Read about that. Of those who are in glory in Revelation 7, 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. No thirst. Why? Because they're perfectly satisfied with Christ. Not only that, they're perfected in themselves. So they, in their perfection of their spirits, can enjoy Christ fully and never have that stupid experience that we have here where we avoid Christ and go to something else in order to satisfy our souls and find ourselves as thirsty as ever. No, no, they look at the Lamb who was slain and they enjoy Him throughout all eternity, feeding on Him. So they, they don't thirst, but we are to have a thirst. Not for things of the world. No, 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 no. We're to have the things of Him, the things of Christ, the things of His kingdom. We're to long for Him, desire Him to come and to meet with us and do it for the sake of our children, not for our sake, but for His glory. Save our children. I mean, is that not what God is saying? Beloved, do you think God doesn't care about your children? You think He doesn't care? Why would this text be here and a whole lot of other verses that we could turn to right now to remind you of the fact that your seed matter to God, your children matter to God? And He puts it in the context of promises. That's what he's saying. I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty. What's the condition? Be thirsty. And I'll send the water. The floods upon the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass and so on. It's a promise even in the context of our children. And the same happens in the day of Pentecost as Peter preaches the promises to you and to your children. Pray. Pray for the promise. What is the promise? The Holy Ghost shed forth in salvation blessing. Yep. Duncan Campbell, and again, made mention of him a number of times, but I was looking up just something about the record that he gave concerning the revival in the Isle of Lewis. Be with, just stick with me here as I read this, and we'll close at the very end of this. He remembers what God did in Lewis. This is 1940s. And he says, 
We were in a village where things were really difficult. A certain section of the Christian community were bitterly opposing me in the grounds that I was not teaching truth because I proclaimed the truth that John Wesley proclaimed and the New Testament proclaims that there is a savior from sin, people opposing the gospel. Now I proclaimed the truth and I was opposed and the opposition was so successful that only seven from this community came near the meetings in the parish church. Everyone avoided the meetings. At the close of one meeting, the session clerk of this particular congregation in which I was ministering came to me and said, quote, Mr. Campbell, these go not out but by prayer and fasting. So we are meeting tonight in the farmhouse. We are going to spend the night in prayer. So we met. There were about 30 of us and prayer began. Now listen to this, because sometimes our days of prayer are hard and will be hard. Listen to this. I found it a very hard meeting. And you will find that. You read the gospel or the accounts of history, you'll find very often before there's any outpouring, not just at the point, but even before it, there's a hardness. There's a hardness. God doesn't make it easy to wait before him. It's only those who truly, truly will press the battle to the gate that will still be there waiting before God. I found it very hard meeting. I found myself battling and getting nowhere as the hours passed. After midnight, between 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning, I turned to a young man in the meeting and said, I feel led of God to ask you to pray. And that dear man rose to his feet and prayed. And in his prayer, he uttered words such as I had never heard in a prayer before. He said, quote, Lord, you made a promise. Are you going to fulfill it? We believe that you are a covenant-keeping God. Will you be true to your covenant? You have said that you would pour water on the thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I do not know how others stand in your presence. I do not know how the ministers stand. But if I know my own heart, I know where I stand. And I tell thee now that I am thirsty. Oh, I am thirsty for a manifestation of the man of thy right hand. That was his prayer thirsty for Christ. And then he said this, Lord, before I sit down, I want to tell you that your honor is at stake. Your honor is at stake. And then Camel goes on and records, believe it or disbelieve it, and you can verify this if you like, the house shook like a leaf. The dishes rattled on the sideboard, and an elder standing beside me said, Mr. Campbell, an earth tremor. I said, yes. And I pronounced the benediction immediately and walked out to find the community alive with an awareness of God. Men and women were carrying stools and chairs and asking, is there room for us in the church? The revival did not break out because Duncan Campbell was there. No, a thousand times no. But because God found a man whom he could trust. A man who dared to believe the promise of God. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. With the God there was even one here. <laughs> even one. Thirsty. Not just for the benefit of themselves. Not just for the benefit of their children, though their children need it. But for the glory of Christ. For his honor. That there may be one even thirsty. And that thirst may manifest itself as we wait before God next Lord's Day. Oh, may the Lord help us, beloved. May the Lord help me, help you. As we have seen here in this picture of revival, something that I trust God will use to stir our hearts. Let's bow together in prayer.